Next slide. Now, I have just shown you a series of slides that I am not talking about. Okay. These are the slides that you have just seen up till now fit the cyborg paradigm rather well in terms of the lineage of offspring from that 1960 moment. The next few slides sort of fit it, but we're moving into the kennel and I'm going to be moving us away from cyborg figuration to companion species figuration. But I want to start it at the cyborg end of things. This is a lovely little Yorkshire Terrier wearing the latest in reproductive technology for the kennel, which is marketed by Whelpwise, uh, it's Whelpwise trademark service, marketed by a company to monitor the pregnancy of a particular kind of dog whose heads are too large to permit natural, so-called natural birth through the birth canal. If the puppies um, are born through the uterine canal, they will break their necks. So that there's an obligatory cesarean section for this particular and several breeds of dogs uh, whose um, his re recent evolutionary history has regarded selection for traits that don't permit non-technologically mediated uh, birthing. Now, it's possible to tell the evolution of dog's story in terms of dog-initiated use of human-provided resources coextensive with the history of the human species, let's say 130-ish thousand years for homo, and sa homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, wolf wannabe dog, uh, you know, dog, wanna dog wannabe wolves, <laughs> making use of human garbage middens, uh, human waste dumps of various kinds, uh, selecting themselves for greater, uh, shorter and shorter tolerance distances to human encampments. These kinds of stories are widely told these days for the evolution of, of um, so-called domesticated dogs, reversing the order of invention. Humans didn't invent dogs, dogs invented themselves and adopted humans as part of their reproductive strategy. So the way of telling the technology story is not that technology invades nature once again, but the dogs have scored another coup and have now appropriated high reproductive technology for their own reproductive strategy. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I must say, a generous reading of Whelpwise trademark, <laughs> a practice which frankly offends me on many levels. But um, it does permit more than one reading, is, is only one of the lessons I want to leave with this. Next slide. Uh, this is straight out of, of um, you know, black helicopters, uh, conspiracy theory, dark areas of the map, uh, you know, secret cartels, uh, surveillance uh, technology. Whoever designed the canine surveillance camera had a very strange <laughs> sense of humor or no sense of humor at all, which is far more likely. <laughs> the the, the, the uh, canine cam is a little mini television set to set in your kennel so that if you're a dog breeder, you can keep track of what's happening with your pooches uh, as, uh, you know, easy to install, weather resistant, connects directly to TV or VCR, your room or office, you know, you can watch your dogs on TV, they're out here in this other room in the pens, and the surveillance camera is taking care of it. Uh, the kind of seeing eye, Foucault you know, Foucault-esque panopticon imagery here is unmistakable. Next slide. Now, um, at this point, I would like to, um, actually, I want to turn on the lights for a minute and um, turn the slides off for a second because I want to do something else. Still staying within the uh, dogs emerging out of cyborg figuration and materialization that I began this lecture with, I want to tell you something about the project to clone pet dogs. How many of you already know about the Missiplicity Project? So I have a little bit of a sense of my audience. One, two, three. Okay, so um, good. <laughs> you know, I'm not telling what you already know. Once upon a time in, Tex uh, in California, actually, there lives, present tense, a dog named Missy, who is a shepherd cross of some kind, might involve some coyote, actually, uh, a mutt, who happens to be the dog of a woman named Candida, who uh, was in a writing group with one of my graduate students. So I get some of this information. Uh, Candida is a woman in her 60s who uh, has a second identity. We don't know, maybe she was in the Weather, other, uh, weather Underground, maybe Witness Protection Program. All we really know is that Candida wasn't always Candida and can't tell anybody who she used to be uh, and is living her second identity. Uh, I like to think it was Weather, other, weather Underground, who knows. Okay. Candida's mutt dog, Missy, 
um, became, is presently the subject of a cloning project funded by Canada's lover, who was a man in his 70s, whose name is never revealed in these stories. <laughs> <laughs> but who is writing a book about the self-made uh, CEO, naturally. I mean, this is, you know, this is pure American, uh, you know, self-made up by the bootstraps stuff, okay? Our self-made CEO, multimillionaire, um, Canada and he don't live together. We also know that he was a funder of the Biosphere projects. Um, we know that he's really interested in high tech and that she's really low tech. That the dog Missy, accompanied by about two and a half million dollars, was flown to Texas A&M uh, to begin a dog cloning project. Now, as you may or may not know, uh, dog reproductive physiology is less well known than our own. Uh, and it is technically more challenging to clone a dog than it is to clone us. Uh, the people who are doing the Missiplicity project, Missiplicity is the name of the website too, are arguing that if they had started cloning Homo sapiens, they'd be through by now, but with dogs, two years is hardly enough time to get started. Mm -hmm. Check out the website and check out uh, many things about it, including the bioethics webpage. It is a bioethics uh, page to die for. These folks, uh, it's, it's like um, very fine parody of the very best bioethics departments in our philosophy departments all over uh, the techno-scientific world. Uh, every possible wrinkle, wrinkle of ethical behavior has been covered in this bioethics uh, list. But it's not parody. It's, it's uh, rules for practice, and uh, well, it should be. Okay. Uh, Misplicity, the cloning project, um, is uh, fronted by a publicity guy who happens to be Canada's son, I only recently learned. Uh, Lou Hawthorne, who has also founded a company called Genetics Savings and Clone <laughs> uh, near Texas A&M, which is a cryopreservation, a freezing uh, preservation system for companion animals, for pets. There are at least two other cryopreservation companies, Lazaron Biotechnologies, which <laughs> I'm surely not alone in hearing Lazarus. Uh, Lazaron Biotechnologies, which had in its advertisement in Dog World magazine this amazing quote on the ad page urging you to take a, a swab from the cheek of your dog and rush it down to uh, the company and get it frozen for a, you know, a couple thousand dollars. By cryopreserving a small skin sample of your animal, you will save its genetic life. <laughs> now the right to life has done a lot of things to us, but so far we have been spared the ethical injunction to save a genetic life. Uh, this is really a wonderful wrinkle uh, on a particularly fetishized kind of life discourse and the supposed ethical obligation to be pro-life. So that, that now, apparently, I have the obligation uh, to save the genetic life of my dogs. Uh, I haven't told them yet. We have enough trouble just kind of getting around the idea of brushing their teeth. Uh, <laughs> I'm having a lot of trouble with this uh, emergent ethical obligation to my dogs. We haven't done it yet. Okay, now, I'm, do I'm joking about something that I actually think of um, as a very serious matter. That is to say, the particular cross-species relationship, not between animal and human any more than the cyborg is about human and machine in some ahistorical, all the time, every here, everywhere way, but about the specific historical circumstances of contemporary companion animal culture in the um, cyborgized, in the heavily uh, informatics and biologics saturated worlds, in the worlds where biologics and informatics have imploded into popular culture and technical culture at so many levels, what does the relationship cross species, in what way does this cross species relationship constitute both of the partners out of the kind of relationality in question? If I'm committed to the notion of emergent technologies and ontological choreography, a term I borrow from my colleague Karis Thompson Cousins, who studied um, in vitro fertilization clinics in San Diego, was particularly interested as a, in, as a feminist theorist in not doing a scolding critique of alienating uh, reproductive technology, invading the body of woman in yet one more way, re uh, refusing that kind of cheap and dirty and caricatured feminist theory. She instead argues about the intricate kinds of ontological choreography going on among all the many actors 